Hello, Clinicians. This is Ali Nasek coming to you from my living room here again. And I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that have come up from my previous video regarding post op pain and also share with you a uh, recent um, um, a little excerpt from a recent presentation I had done down in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it was a pre uh, pretty nice again, once again, leaving Boston and going to a different place and uh, talking about an area I'm very passionate about, which is endodontic therapy and how to improve it. And this particular presentation was on motion design and various ways of improving instrument safety which i think is very important to all of you uh, but before i show you that excerpt i want to also answer a couple of questions about the previous video i had prepared on the topic of um, um, a post-operative pain now post-operative pain is something that all of us care about as endodontic practitioners. Uh, patients uh, have a really uh, kind of a distorted view of what root canal therapy is. Uh, during the root canal procedure, I guarantee my patients a completely painless experience because I personally believe that endodontic therapy can be completely painless if you know how to anesthetize people. And I know I promised the video on mandibular blocks and that is coming for sure in 2018, I promise you that. Uh, but um, in the meantime, uh, just the understanding that post our pain can also be managed the best way possible through methods and mechanisms that reduce the three factors that I mentioned in the previous video, which is both biological, uh, chemical, and mechanical trauma to the periapex peri are important factors. We talked about the biological trauma being the most of the, um, the bacteria and bacterial antigens, the lactopolysaccharides and various forms of antigens that have been known to be either viruses as well as fungus as well as bacteria. All of those things are during different kinds of instrument motion can get pushed out the apex and cause post-operative pain the introduction of various chemicals such as our hypochloride or different types of um, irrigants that are ir irritation inducing can also pr um, provide pain. And one area that had come up as a question was the use of sealers. And it's funny that I forgot to mention the, uh, the, that aspect of different sealers that are used. Sealers that are more biocompatible will clearly cause less post-op pain uh, in patients. Um, and that's another important factor. And lastly, the mechanical type of trauma can also increase the pain such as not having a proper reference point during your instrumentation and going past the apex routinely because remember that the apical area and that constriction is really only about a half a millimeter so if you're not very careful very precise in both the measurement and by restricting that um, motion to specifically that working length by having stable reference points respecting it uh, or all of those factors are important for uh, mechanical trauma to the periapical area and getting past the apex. Uh, to that effect also, I think the use of apex locators and also some of the hand pieces that have apex locator in them can also be helpful. I've had patients that uh, uh, have had a history of various types of uh, non-odontogenic pains that I have suspected and have required endodontic therapy. So things such as trigeminal neuralgias and things like that that have had, we've had to, for some reason or another, go inside the tooth. And in those types of cases, it's very, very important not to add any inflammation to the apical area so in those cases I've worked with the apex locator connected to my handpiece the entire time making sure that I never get past the apex and that all my instrumentation is confined to inside the tooth that would be an important factor for reducing the post-op pain so with that I'm gonna just move on to show you a little excerpt of this video from my presentation in Den Denver and um, um, in the meantime I hope that this is gonna be useful to you and uh, remember that at all time our goal is to save some teeth is that the it's the bells and whistles and all these little cool technologies helping us maybe make a better quicker diagnosis and be a little bit faster in, in, in achieving our results but the foundational understanding of what we need to do has remained the same and still the same and we need to understand those to follow that and basically what i want to do is to talk about some of the foundational understanding for instrument and motion so that by understanding how instruments work maybe we can help uh, ourselves in terms of using them properly in the canal and not in reduce our rate of separation um, I, I usually the analogy i use is the difference between a a, a chef and a line cook is that a line cook, even a recipe, can follow a recipe and get good results. But the moment you kind of displace or take away, a, you know, an ingredient, then all of a sudden it's a problem because 
to have been following a recipe as opposed to understand the concepts of flavor, whereas a chef can easily substitute and basically uh, make something happen. So, you know, you guys, I'm sure everybody watches uh, that show Chopped on the Food Network. That's my demise. I watch that at night and then I raid the, 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 the fridge, which is really a bad deal. So don't watch it at night. So uh, it's, it's a good show, but that's basically it. You know, these chefs are given all kinds of weird ingredients and they come up with like tasty food. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk uh, about these instruments, uh, safety features, about design and metallurgy and things like that. Let's talk also about 10 important concepts that everyone in this room has to understand in order to reduce your instrumentation breakage rate. Okay. And some of you guys may already know this stuff and some may not, but we're going to go through uh, the most important ones. So obviously torque, cyclic fatigue, torque is the resistance to rotation, right? So files that don't have good torque resistance, they will unwind very quickly. Uh, files that have good torque resistance, they will cut better because they're like, a, you know, it's like a sharper knife. Cyclic fatigue is the going back and forth, back and forth. If you take a, um, a dry cleaner's kind of a hanger and you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you're gonna end up getting like these grain boundaries that form in the middle from going back and forth and that weakens the middle and that's a, a, a source of separation of an instrument. The metallurgy then is directly affected through these torque and cyclic fatigue situation. So we now know that we have heat treated files and we have non-heat treated files, which are like conventional files, right? Conventional files have better torque resistance, so they can cut better, they're sharper, they don't unwind, but they have lower cyclic fatigue resistance. So if they have in a, in a very curved route, they going back and forth, they could separate in that re for that reason. However, heat treated files have great cyclic fatigue resistance. They're very flexible, they can go back and forth, but they have low torque uh, resistance and therefore they unwind more readily and they don't cut as much because the edge doesn't remain, the edge fidelity is gone, so it does become dull very quickly. Okay, so in this situation with metallurgy, heat treated files and austenitic files, which is you know austenitic and martensitic files, the two different brands of files, they, they, are, they each shine in different areas of torque resistance versus cyclic fatigue resistance. So here's an idea. Why not hybridize instrumentation so that you can get the best of both worlds in areas where you can have, where you need more torque resistance? Use an austenitic file. You have more curvature and more advanced canal? Use a uh, heat treated file, a martensitic file. And chip space is another very important concept. We're going to show in a second. Chip space is where, basically, if you think of a spoon, uh, the area in the middle of the spoon where you collect the food, that's the chip space of a file. As the file cuts, it collects the debris. When the chip space is full, all of a sudden, the, the pressure is getting exerted into the file, so the file starts to get torqued. So clearing the chip space is a very important ingredient of success and reduction of the rate of uh, file separation. Engagement time. This is it. I, this, some of these terms, I'm, I have to admit, I've invented kind of myself. It doesn't exist in the literature, or probably not even engineering literature, but it just makes sense, right? As I said, over the 20 some years of you've done this stuff, and I've done over 25,000 cases with rotary instruments, so you kind of notice patterns. Anyway, engagement time. What is engagement time? It's something that is just not talked about at all in, at all in the literature. It's the amount of time you're actually contacting Denton. So when a file is, goes into the canal, it's, you know, you could be holding your hand in an area where the file is loose, so that's not engagement time. But the amount of time that the file is actually cutting, where it's engaging, that's a critical point. And we have done, at Rewildendo, over 1,000 hands-on programs. And I tell you, I see there is no standard. People's idea of engagement time is very different. Some people are sitting there and just like, using it like a black and decker drill. Other people are just like very light. So this is the kind of variance that has to get addressed and we have to get people all on par so we can have a more predictable approach. So when I say something, you know, when I say, I don't know, orange, you see an orange in front of yourself and not an apple.